All right, my sincere thanks to Marsha for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to come and speak at Stanford. I'm always so inspired uh, to come here to this campus where so many amazing discoveries have been made, and I always wonder at how it all gets done when you look out the window at this spectacular uh, environment. So that just makes it doubly impressive. So I'm going to frame my uh, talk in the context of how are the, what are the basic mechanisms of establishing sex differences in the brain and what does that mean then in terms of disease susceptibility. So your brain has sex differences that are determined by three factors. Your genes, XX versus XY, your environment, how you're raised, how your uh, parents teach you, et cetera, and your hormones, which I would argue are reign supreme, but there are certainly other contributions. But without doubt, in humans, environment and experience are likely dominant, and they're going to be impossible to control for, because every one of us, by definition, has a unique environment and experience. And so for us to try to understand the biological origins of sex differences in the human brain, we have to turn to a circumstance in which we can control environment and experience and then parse out uh, biological from um, experiments and environment. So my animal model is the increasingly exotic laboratory rat, which is not the mouse. Right? And I've stuck with the rat for all these years because it was sort of one of the first animals used for studying uh, the sex differences in behavior. Um, and also because I tend to do everything in little tiny pups and you know every little ounce of, of tissue matters and stuff. So, um, so and I'm trying to, I have this problem of getting defensive about not studying mice. I am not defensive that I don't study mice. Rats are a perfectly good experimental animal. All right, let's move on. Okay. Um, so we now know, it used to be that we only thought of sex differences in the context of reproduction. Um, but we now know that just about any endpoint you can mention in the brain in, in, during development is at some time, in some way, going to be modulated by the sex of the animal. So this is sort of my schematic of everything that happens in the brain that we as neuroscientists care about. We start with neurulation. As early as primary embryogenesis, there are sex differences in uh, epigenetic removal of marks, and there's sex differences in the folding of the neural tube. Neurogenesis, gliogenesis, migration, dendritic growth, myelination, synaptogenesis, synaptic pruning, apoptosis. Every one of these endpoints is going to vary between males and females in some part of the brain at some time. And I could spend the next 45 minutes delighting myself by listing them all in great detail and putting you all to sleep. Um, and I would only succeed in just hopefully convincing you that there are pervasive and profound sex differences throughout the brain. There's also a whole swaths of the brain that are not different in males and females. And that is our challenge, is to figure out where the sex differences are, when and how they occur, and what they mean. They are established early, uh, before and after birth, during a process called sexual differentiation of the brain. And that's sort of schematically organized here, that we start with the gonad, which is bipotentials, just a little schmutz of cells near the your genital sinus below the kidney, and it is equally capable of becoming a testis or an ovary, but by default, it's going to become an ovary. Now, the term default upsets some people. Please try not to be upset by the term default. It simply means that in the absence of the Y chromosome and the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome, uh, you will get an ovary. If that Y chromosome is present with the SRY gene, you will instead get a testis. So it's what kind of diverts away from the default programming. The brain, I would argue, is equally bipotential. It's also capable of taking on a male or female phenotype, and it will, oh, sorry, before I get there, the testis function in terms of brain sex differences produce testosterone, and testosterone is a precursor hormone to estradiol, so E2 stands for estradiol, converted by the enzyme aromatase. And in the rodent animal model, estradiol is, in fact, the critical masculinizing hormone. And everybody thinks, that everybody puts gender onto hormones, and everybody thinks of estradiol as a female hormone. But in the context of brain development in our rodent animal models, it is the masculinizing hormone. All right, so we have this equally bipotential brain, and it, by default, is undergoing to go the process of feminization. And I would say that this is because, if you think about it, Mother Nature wants to make sure that your brain sex and your gonad sex are in sync. Mother Nature does not care about your genetic sex. Whether you're XX or XY is irrelevant. What is important is, is that your physiology and your behavior are in sync with your gamete production, which, as we know, is profoundly different in males versus females. So by default, it will go to the feminine pathway unless there are very high levels of estradiol during a critical developmental window, and at which point the brain will convert to the masculinized phenotype and will create masculine sex behavior in adulthood. So again, so behavior and physiology match your gonad, or we'll have female sexual behavior in adulthood. So 
and I, I give sex behavior as the endpoint because that's what I'm not going to talk about as, as the, uh, the readout of brain sex that I've been using for the past 20 years. And I, I've been using that while interrogating one system in great detail, which is the preoptic area of the brain. Preoptic, it has nothing to do with vision. It just happens to be pre to the optic chiasm. It's a rather um, small region. It's, it's uh, rostral to the hypothalamus, but it's actually telencephalic in origin. It is the essential brain region for the ability to express male sex behavior. If you lesion this brain region, males lose all interest in sex. If you stimulate this brain region, males lose all interest in anything but sex. So it's, we have a nice ability to correlate neuroanatomical changes in this brain regions to adult behavior. And those changes are set during early life. This is a brain area that has a lot of sex differences in it, but we've, again, just trying to do a deep dive on one particular one, which is synaptogenesis, the formation of dendritic spines. And I will completely confess the reason that we've looked at dendritic spines is because they're easier to count than our non-spine synapses. So this is a, a beautiful neuron that bears absolutely no resemblance to preoptic area neurons. Uh, preoptic area neurons are very plain and ugly. They're not even color coded. Um, they don't branch very much, but they are studded with spines. Um, and what we have found over many years of, of quantifying this in many different ways is that males reliably have twice the density of dendritic spine synapses as the females. We, we see that at birth, we see it at five days of age, 20 days of age, 60 days of age, 90 days of age. And this, this sex difference is established in the first few days of life during the sensitive period for sex differentiation. In adulthood, if we uh, perform tests of male uh, copulatory behavior, the really robust copulatory males have a higher density of spines than the sort of little uh, less robust males, and then the females continue to have obviously very low density of spines. So we also, as neuroendocrinologists, do the classic experiment, teach, treat the females with a masculinizing dose of steroid. We tend to like to use estradiol as our, as our steroid hormone just to get past any differences in metabolism of aromatization or anything. Um, and we can masculinize this pattern of dendritic spine. So if we're looking at a, a change in synaptogenesis, what's the mechanism? It must be a neurotransmitter, right? And it would seem obvious. Well, we and others expended many, many years exploring every neurotransmitter known to man uh, as the X explanation for this sex difference in, in synaptogenesis. And we all concluded, well, it's complicated. You know, it takes a lot of different neurotransmitters. After all, it's re reproduction. It's so vitally important. It must be redundant and, and, and overdone, et cetera. But we were all wrong um, because it's, it's uh, actually not a neurotransmitter at all, which was just a discovery made by a graduate student in my lab. It's actually this whole process is mediated by prostaglandins. Prosta what? Prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, membrane-derived signaling molecules normally associated with inflammation. In fact, it was one single prostaglandin, PGE2, which is the prostaglandin that gives you a fever, it gives you aches and pains, it's what you take aspirin and Tylenol and everything else up for to knock it down uh, when you're feeling sick. And so Stuart Amato, through a series of studies in his thesis, discovered that estradiol, after being aromatized from testosterone, Binding to the estrogen receptor will upregulate the cyclooxygenase enzyme COX-2 and COX-1 to create PGE2, which is going to be released, we believe, from, we believed at this time, from neurons, um, acting on neighboring astrocytes and through a calcium-dependent uh, mechanism causing glutamate release, which is going to activate uh, AMP receptors on neighboring dendrites. And that was kind of where our story s stood, sort of uh, circa uh, 2004. Stewart also did the, the money experiment and that he showed that if he injected newborn pups, so you're going to see this model repeatedly. So we have here this critical period for sex differentiation. Here's day of birth. We're dealing with little tiny pinkies. And, and Stewart injected PGE2 on the day they were born. And one day later, no other manipulations, relate, raises them to adulthood, and then asks, are you male? So he injected females. Now, we have to give them testosterone as adults, because even a self-respecting male won't behave like a male if he doesn't have testosterone. So we give her testosterone present her with a sexually receptive female and say, are you male? And these females were absolutely undistinguishable from normally masculinized males. He did the counter experiment in which he inhibited their cyclooxygenase enzymes with indomethacin or aspirin, and that, in fact, blocked their male sex behavior in adulthood. They didn't turn into females, right? They didn't show female sex behavior. They simply became uninterested in females and asexual, more or less. So along the way, a new graduate student joined the lab, Christopher Wright, and he discovered that a single injection of PGE2 on the day of birth was sufficient to masculinize dendritic spine density and the sex behavior of the animals. 
And I found this to just be stunning. I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I said, that's crazy. That's just Mother Nature playing with fire. How can one tiny little exposure to this short-lived membrane-derived molecule change the course of reproductive biology and the future of the species forever? So we said, we must be doing something else. We must be lighting a fuse, right? We must be starting a reaction that is going to endure for some uh, period of time. And so we asked, is there a positive feed-forward mechanism, aka lighting? a fuse, and is there another cell type that might be making that prostaglandin? And conveniently for us, this was right around the time that everybody was falling in love with the cell that we had all ignored for so many years, the microglia, uh, which are so unfortunately named because they're not glia at all. Uh, they're actually the brain's own immune system. Right? They're derived from the embryonic yolk sac. They migrate into the brain prior to the closing of the blood-brain barrier. They disperse out uniformly throughout the brain, tiling themselves around, take up residence, and they're uh, we used to believe there they wait. And, and we used to think that they just waited until an injury occurred and then they were reacted. Um, and so they had been studied a great deal in the context of injury because they both respond to and produce prostaglandins. So this is just a, a they, so we have really rethought microglia in the last five years or so and found out that they're not just sitting there waiting. They're not quite essent. We used to use that term quite essent microglia. They, there's, they are anything but. They are constantly moving. Their, their processes are constantly moving. And this is just an image that we took. This, the red one is the microglia. The blue is DAPI, and these are mostly neurons. And you can see that this microglia has his arms wrapped around multiple uh, neurons and probably astrocytes. They tend to particularly cluster around uh, synapses as well. And he's checking on them, and that's what they do. They constantly survey. So we now refer to them as surveying microglia, and they're sort of, they have a stable that every microglia is responsible for, and they sort of, you know, sound off, everybody, okay, 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 one, two, three, everybody's okay, good, everybody's okay. In fact, they estimate it takes about two hours for your entire brain to be surveyed by your microglia. What you don't want to have happen is that they find something wrong with your neuron, because then it's, gulp, you're engulfed, and oop, you're out. So they constantly survey. So Katie Lenz in the lab, it's a new postdoc, and she asks a simple question, is there a sex difference in microglia in the newborn POA? And this is a um, DAPI image stained with IBA1, a microglia-specific marker. This is the anterior commissure. This is the medial preoptic area, the region that we're talking about. And she just went in and counted the density of microglia. And she found that males had significantly more than females per unit area. Uh, if we treated the females two days prior with a masculinizing dose of estradiol, they came right up to the male level. So that's classic neuroendocrinology. And if we treated with a minocycline, a tetracycline-based antibiotic that's a dirty drug, but at low doses, relatively specific at calming down microglia, it, it, it blocked the effects of the estradiols and kept the female right at uh, the other female level. So in other words, it blocked masculinization of the microglia. Now, as you saw from the image I showed before, these microglia take on a variety of shapes. That's one of their really charming capabilities is how much they can change. I mean, you talk about plasticity. I mean, these guys can really change. And so they can go from what's called this amoeboid shape. And do not confuse this amoeboid shape with meaning that they've got cilia and they're going to be running off to some other place. That's not what they're doing. They just look sort of amoeboid, stout, thick, and this thin is your classic surveying microglia. The, the more kind of amoeboid and stout like they are, the more worked up they are, the more they're in what we call the activational state, and the more they're associated with making prostaglandin E2 just at rest. So she also looked at the morphology of the microglia throughout the preoptic area, and here she found that the male had about twice as many as these amoeboid and stout, these activated microglia. The female that was treated with estradiol, wow, her microglia really worked up, and then when she could block it with the minocycline, again, just kept them nice and calm down. They stayed in that ramified morphology. And this is what it actually looks like. It's an image here. You can see here in the males, you see how kind of blebby and thick all his microglia are. They also are filled with uh, phagocytic cups, which is a phenomenon that we're uh, observing, we're investigating right now. Whereas the females are all ramified, they're surveying, they're checked, they're nice and filigreed and lacy-like looking. And you can also note that the entire population has changed, right? This is not uh, particularly localized. This is all in the preoptic area only, though. So how do we relate this to the prostaglandins and the sex differentiation process? If we block the Cox enzymes in the male, it decreases his microglia activation. And if we treat the female with a single injection of PGE2, it turns on her microglia. In fact, we lit that fuse uh, and got those microglia all worked up. And in experiments I won't show you, it in fact elevates PGE2 in the female brain. 
So we have concluded that that's the, the, the process for how one single injection can carry on this whole masculinization process. And now just to put together sort of the, the, the bigger cellular uh, picture as we are, are viewing it right now, this is a uh, animation that will show the, the current cellular players. This is a neuron here. This is a neighboring astrocyte who I haven't talked about much, but they greatly changed their morphology in males and females. And here's a microglia. So we start with the steroid hormone, it's gonna fall out of the sky, testosterone, it's gonna be aromatized to estradiol, it's gonna to bind to the estrogen receptor, translocate to the nucleus, and transcribe the cyclooxygenase one and two genes, which are gonna convert arachidonic acid into PGE2. That's gonna activate on EP2 and four receptors, which are cyclic AMP linked and activate protein kinase A, which phosphorylates the GLUR2 subunit of the AMP receptor, causing them to cluster at the membranes. The PGE2 is also gonna cause the microglia to make additional PGE2, which is gonna act on the neighboring astrocytes in the calcium dependent manner cause glutamate release, activating the amper receptors, causing the formation and stabilization of dendritic spines. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay, so that's where we stood about circa 2012. Okay, so what, we had a lot of surprises along the way here, and some surprises so far was that it is, it's prostaglandins, not neurotransmitters that are a primary target of hormone-induced masculinization. That still surprises me to this day. Microglia, non-neuronal cells, are a key partner in this process of sex differentiation, and that early synaptic pattern, as I told you, it endures into adulthood. Now, when we first started studies of neuroanatomical sexual differentiation of the brain, we used to use terms like hardwired architecture blueprints, because that's how we thought of the brain at the time that we were first making these discoveries. We all now know the brain is hugely plastic, right? Synapses come and go all the time. There's no just plugging a wire into a wall and then you're done. So we said, how can it be that this pattern of synaptic differences is maintained across life? And it's literally telephone poles along a wire. I mean, they're just perfectly spaced and the male's just twice as dense as the female. So this was right around the time, oh here, that's just to show that graphically here. Again, that's not my neuron. Um, but it illustrates it quite, quite nicely how they really are just very regularly spaced. So right around the time everybody's also rediscovering epigenetics is everybody's new favorite form of cellular memory. As you know, there are two canonical forms of epigenetics. There are changes to the histones that make up the nucleosomes, and then there's direct methylation of cytosines proximal to guanines on the DNA. We decided to focus on this uh, type of epigenetic change because we said ours is so enduring. It's lasting from you know, prenatal all the way through to adulthood. How is this achieved? Through a class of enzymes called DNMTs or DNA methyltransferases. There's two main categories, the DNMT1s, which are considered for methyl maintenance. They, uh, 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 methylation maintenance, they're the ones that keep a cell true to its phenotype so that when a cell in your liver divides, it stays a liver cell, versus the DNMT3As, which are considered your de novo, your experience-dependent methylation enzymes. And they add methyl groups to the cytosines, as I said, and then that will attract methyl binding proteins, and in sort of a very simplistic fashion, that will block transcription. That's, you know, epigenetics 101, that's one type of epigenetic suppression. Many, many exceptions to this very uh, standard uh, scenario are emerging, but for our purposes here, this is, this is how we're going to view it as working. So uh, Bridget Nugent in the lab asked the simple question, is there a sex difference in DNMTs and DNA methylation in the neonatal POA? And so again, she's looking right here in the pinkies, and she's looking right here during this uh, critical period. First thing she did was she quantified all three DNMTs across the entire first week of life by mRNA and Western and found absolutely no sex difference. Second thing she said was, I need to find a new lab. Third thing she said is I said, well, let's try one. They're enzymes, okay? And what matters is activity when it comes to enzymes. And we also, in my lab, we love kits. We, we're, we are molecular biologists uh, uh, wannabes, so we're happy to order up kits that will let us measure things easily. And there's a nice kit to measure DNMT activity assay, and it's just a fluorometric or color metric based on a, a methyl donor. So we extracted out the POA of individual male and females, and then we looked at the relative activity based on the color change. So each well would represent an individual animal. This allows us to quantify a lot of, of animals at any given time. And so here she did an exhaustive analysis starting on the day of birth, six hours after they were born, two days old, four days old, and one week old. First thing you can notice is that all of the activity drops by one week old, and this is the end of the sensitive period for sex differentiation of the brain. So everybody's activity is down. If we look right after birth, here's the female with much higher level than the uh, male and the female that was masculinized with steroid within six hours, that's six hours after the steroid was given right when she was born. That persists for two 
two days, by four days, the sex difference is starting to go away, and then everybody drops. So is that DNA T activity actually having an effect on the DNA methylation? We ordered up another kit that's also antibody-based, color metric, and allows us to measure global DNA methylation. Again, we just extract out the nuclei, and we're just looking at, we're isolating the DNA and looking at the methylation of the DNA very broadly, and you can see it maps perfectly. Females have about twice the methylation of the males. If they were masculinized with estradiol two days earlier, it comes down to the male level. So great, we're all happy. Uh, we think this is just fitting in perfectly. Uh, we, we've you know, we discovered how sex differentiation occurs. We're all excited. We send it out, uh, and everybody believes it except reviewer number three. <laughs> it's always reviewer number three. And reviewer number three says, you've got to be kidding me. You really want me to believe that the female brain has twice the DNA methylation as the male? That's extraordinary. And extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And I will not believe it until you sequence the entire genome um, after bisulfite conversion and you map the methylation throughout. And we said, no, 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 please don't make us do it. And we argued and pleaded and begged and put money under the table and nothing, nothing would convince them. They said, you have to do it. And so finally I said, okay, you know, we have to have faith in our result, too. So we have to really find out, and, and we have to do it right. So, you know, we held our nose, jumped into the deep end, and we did do it right. We did nine animals, three males, three females, three females masculinized by estradiol. And we did sequence the entire genome. We did not do any reduced representation. We didn't do any methyl dip or methyl seek or anything like that. It was all um, WGBS. So what did we find? Well, we found that we were right, but not exactly in the way that we thought we were. So this figure takes a minute to kind of adjust to. So you have to, uh, along the x-axis here, we're looking at the percent methylation for an individual CPG. Either it has 0 to 10 percent methylation or it's 90 to 100 percent methylated. And this is the number of sites that showed that level of methylation. So the first thing you notice is that most of the sites are heavily methylated, and that's consistent with most CPGs are heavily methylated. Very few are unmethylated. When we look at those that are heavily methylated, the females have significantly more than the females treated with estradiol and the males. Interestingly, as soon as we drop down a little bit, the sex difference reverses, then goes away, and then when we get to where there's very little uh, sex uh, methylation, again, the sex difference is reversed. So it's almost as if the methylation of the genome was kind of go in, in the females compared to the males. So then we just focused on, well, what about those sites that are 100 percent methylated? And here you can get a sense of the three animals for each of the groups. Um, these are the three males, the three females, the three females plus estradiol. And as you can see, it almost perfectly recapitulates that kit that did global methylation, uh, which so we now think that that kit is biased towards 100 percent methylated sites. But indeed, females have significantly more fully methylated sites than males. So where are these methylated sites? Now we think, all right, this is, we're golden. Now we're gonna find the genes that mediate sex differentiation. We're gonna find all, all these promoters, all these cool genes, et cetera. Wrong. So they're not on, in CPG islands, which are what hang out around promoters. They're not even on CPG shores. They're sort of in that vague, dark matter of other, which was a total surprise. And then we said, okay, well, what about outside of the CPG islands? We looked at promoters, exons, introns, and intergenic, and again, it's almost all in the intergenic region. Now, this is where most DNA methylation is anyway, but this is only looking at the sex differences, right? So there's something going on in the dark matter of the DNA that we don't understand, and we are still sort of shaking our head over this, and we're not quite sure how we're going to get at it, and we're, we're we're working on it. Anybody's got any ideas? I would love to hear them. We would love to, to collaborate on a way to, to mine this data more carefully. So instead, we have to ask the question, though, is this methylation important? Right? So here, we turn to tools that we've gotten from the cancer biologists, where they're very interested in epigenetics of super, uh, tumor suppressor genes, and they've been, uh, developed inhibitors of these DNMT enzymes, two that are currently in clinical use, or zebularin and RG108. They act through slightly different mechanisms. But what they both do is they block the enzyme, but importantly, they also demethylate the DNA. Right, so it's not just that they block further methylation, they actually cause an active demethylation of the DNA. We can talk about uh, that later as well. So what Bridget did was went back to our, our model and she injected right into the brain on the day of birth, one day later, RG108 and uh, zebularin. She didn't do any other manipulations, raised them to adulthood, looked at their dendritic spines, and looked at their behavior. 
So first we'll look at the dendritic spines. If we just focus on the bright red as being the females in honor of International Women's Day, um, they are the, the normal females. And you can see here as we looked at, we did, this is what a real POA neuron looks like. That's why I don't show them very often, but you can see all the spines. And we use spinophilin as a proxy marker of the spines. This is the normal female. This is the female that was treated with zebularin 60 days earlier, right? Over here, zebularin and RG108. Uh, Again, uh, so you see the sex difference here, and these females are completely masculinized by two injections 60 days earlier. Well, what about their uh, behavior? Again, the bright red of the normal females, they don't tend to mount very often unless they were treated with RG108, uh, or if they were treated with zebularin, they very rarely throw thrusting behavior unless they were treated with RG108 and zebularin. So they were, in fact, fully masculinized by this treatment. So we conclude that while feminization might still be this default pathway, it's actually a very active suppression of masculinization via DNA methylation. So the female somehow has to shut down that male genetic program in order for the female program to, to come forth. And masculinization is an is a emancipation, right? It's an escape from suppression of this active DNA methylation by the female. And that is achieved by estradiol inhibiting this DNT enzyme. So instead of steroids binding to transcription factors altering gene expression, they're actually working up here at 30,000 feet, having a global broad effect on on the genome that we still don't fully understand. What are the genes that are affected? So what we also use this for to look at the transcriptome with and without DNMT inhibition. Again, thought, okay, here we go. This is going to be the holy grail, and we're going to find the genes that are affecting sex differentiation. Uh, we did here, we treated with the, the zebularin, and we did right in the very, very short term. We looked at the transcriptome. And we had a big surprise here, and we found only 70 genes that were different in males and females. We thought we'd have hundreds, if not thousands, that would be different. This was with a very high false discovery rate and a very low fold difference, only one and a half. If we put high stringency on it, we came up with about 25 genes. They were also equally split between males and females. That was kind of disappointing. The only gene that made any sense in there was aromatase, and we'd already known that for 40 plus years, so that was a sad day. So we said, okay, well, let's go back. This is RNA-seq data. It's got transcripts, uh, isoforms that we can look at as well. Here just shows you a heat map. There are many, many more transcripts that were different in males and females. Here's a heat map. Here's the female. Here's the male. And here's the female that was treated with the DNMT inhibitor. And you can see the striking overlap in the heat map. Again, not many genes that showed up again that were, you know, and, and believe me, we looked for the Cox enzymes and the PGE2s and the glutamate receptors and et cetera. But then one popped out. My student says, what is this thing? Mast cell protease 2. I said, mast cells, mast cells. Oh, my God, I haven't heard about mast cells in years. What are mast cells? Mast cells are another innate immune cell of the brain. They originate in the bone marrow, separate from the microglia. They are myeloid lineage. They also have a population that gets into the brain before the blood-brain barrier closes, and they take up permanent residence there. They also traffic in and out during injury. They are all over your body. They're in your skin. They're in your nose. They're in your mouth. And they're central to allergic response, and they're the first responders in injury. So they are what gives you a rash. There's what gives you a, a runny nose. They're what give you anaphylactic shock. So they will irritate you and they will kill you. So they are probably, and as you can see, they are packed full of these secretory granules. And that's how they've been thought of in the brain is what they do is there's an injury of the brain, they rush to the site of the injury, they degranulate, and they dump all their contents and they go, woo, 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 and they call in the microglia and the microglia come in and they phagocytose all the dead bodies and carry them away and shut down the scene of the accident and say, okay, everybody go home now, there's nothing to see here. And, that, and that's been the entire way in which they've been studied. So we asked the simple question, Lindsay Pickett, is there a sex difference in these mast cells in the neonatal POA? This is what they look like in the brain. Okay, this is the bottom of the brain. This is the third ventricle. The stuff that looks like dirt on the slide, those are mast cells. You don't even have to use immunohistochemistry. You can just use toluidine blue, except for the reviewers make you use immunohistochemistry. So everybody in my lab wants to count mast cells. This is how you do it. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm done. Let's go to lunch. So she did an exhaustive survey of counting the uh, mast cells from the day of birth up to adulthood. And as you can see, throughout the period of sex differentiation, the males have significantly more mast cells than the females. After the critical period, the mast cell numbers overall jump down, pop back up, interestingly, in adulthood, but uh, no sex differences there. So because these mast cells can both irritate you and kill you, they have also as a useful toolkit for studying them to both prevent their degranulation and to induce it. So chromalin and catoctophin will prevent it, 480-80 will induce it. 
So here, uh, Lindsay did the simple experiment of injecting with chromalin to stabilize or 4080 to induce degranulation on the day of birth and one day after. So she's going to target the mast cells, and then she's going to ask, what does it do to the microglia? Because it's kind of following the injury model. And here is our sex difference of these activated microglia. Here's the male versus the female. Unless we calmed down his microglia for two days prior, or calmed down his uh, mast cells and prevented them from degranulating, his microglia completely calmed down. And here's the female that we treated with a stimulator. And as you can see, her microglia are completely worked up. And this is an image to show that these are the two I showed you before. This is the male with the blebby activated microglia, the female with a nice calm lacy microglia. Look at her microglia after the degranulated mast cells. I mean, they're just angry. They're just really, really worked up. And again, lots of phagocytic cups in there. And his are nice and calm and surveying, behaving themselves as they should. Okay, does this affect adult behavior? Can we actually modify sexual differentiation just by degranulating or stabilizing mast cells? So here we use catotophen because we could put this in the drinking water of the dam because the male's process of sex differentiation begins prenatally and we use chromalin to degranulate the mast cells. Again, treated right here during this critical period, raised to adulthood and asked, are you male? <clears throat> so when we degranulate the mast cells in females, it slightly masculinizes them. This is the, the a mo a measure of their motivation to mate. This is how long it takes them to mount. This is the latency. This is normal females. They show a high latency unless their mast cells were degranulated early in life. Um, no effect on the males. The chromalin not having an effects here. And here's a female showing increased mount rate after 48080. This is not a, like a complete masculinization, but again, the only thing we've targeted are the mast cells. Stabilizing them has uh, big effects on the males. Here's the catotfitin. His mount rate goes significantly down. No effect on the females. And then his latency to ejaculate is significantly increased, as is the number of ejaculations when we set a period of time uh, for the test. And th these are actually hard parameters to manipulate. People who study male sex behavior will tell you. So are these mast cells being modulated by estradiol? Is that the mechanism? Uh, to our surprise, we didn't expect this, it turns out most of these mast cells have estrogen receptors in them, about half of them um, in both males and females. This is just a repeat of the sex difference, and both of them have about half of ER alpha. We did not look at ER beta. And if we treat with estradiol, we can actually change the number. So here's the sex difference again, male versus female. If we treat it with estradiol for a few days earlier, her number of mast cells goes significantly up. And then interestingly, most mast cells hang out in the meninges. They're supposed to be at the uh, surface areas between the environment and the interior. That's where they, they hang out. But in the POA, they're heavily in the neural pill, uh, about 40%. And if we treat with uh, estradiol, about half of them appear to move into the neural pill, which suggests a, a fascinating role for estradiol in uh, pulling them into the brain. So what is the language that the mast cells are speaking? To get to this, we had to create pure mast cell cultures. So we isolated them out of the brains of neonate, put them in a dish, and grew them up for a couple of weeks and assured that we had a pure mast cell culture. And then we could treat them and take the medium off and ask, what, what is your language here? Measure what's going on. And so we measured prostaglandins, we measured cytokines, et cetera, but the only thing that we found that increases was histamine. So estradiol significantly degranulates the mast cells. I didn't show that, but it degranulates them, and they are releasing histamine when they're degranulating to the same level that the 48080 does. So what is that histamine doing? So now we take this conditioned media from these cultured mast cells, and we put them on cultured neurons with and without microglia. So we're just asking, what's in that media that's going to have an effect? So here we're going to measure the ability of that culture to produce prostaglandin E2. Here's the control female, and if she's treated here with estradiol-mediated media, not estradiol itself, but the media, there's a significant increase in PGE2 that's blocked by histamine receptor antagonists. If we just treat with histamine, we don't bother with the media at all, we get a nice induction of PGE2, and we can block that with the antagonist. Here we show, though, that it does require the microglia. So the little black spidery things are the microglia. Here's the female control. Just treat her with estradiol, her cells. You get a nice, beautiful PGE2. But if there's no microglia, no PGE2. Just treat with histamine. If there's microglia, nice PGE2. If there's no microglia, no PGE2. So we conclude that the microglia are actually in service to the mast cells. And it's the histamine produced by the mast cells that is driving the sex differentiation process. So we need four cells, neurons and astrocytes, both of neuronal origin, microglia and mast cells, both of the immune system origin. 
Okay, so up to this point, you would say she's been giving two different talks, one's on neuroinflammation, one's on uh, neuroepigenetics, and the two aren't crossing each other very well at all. So what we are, now we are making that connection, and just a few last slides to show that, because I think I'm okay on time. So when we, we looked at those genes that were affected by neonatal DNFT inhibition, as I said, mast cell 2 stuck out, but then also you can do things like gene ontology, right? You can look for patterns. And so when we did the gene ontology analysis, we found you know, several gene ontology uh, groups that had changed, but one that changed significantly in females and females treated with a DNMT inhibitor, who by the way had hundreds of genes that went up consistent with their higher methylation. We found that immune response genes were epigenetically repressed in females. So here you have positive regulation of immune response, immune effector, leukocyte activation, immune response, external stimulus, immune system response, defense response, antigen processing, and presentation. So this would be consistent with the idea of part of that uh, suppression of masculinization is to shut down all those immune response genes. So now I'm going to get into a circular argument. So my hypothesis is that increased immune activation in males decreases DNMT activity, which derepresses immune response genes, right? And that that's going around in a circle. So how are we going to test that? I would predict that if I generate inflammation, it will decrease DNMT activity. And I have two ways I can generate inflammation. I can degranulate the mast cells, or I can inject with PGE2. So that's what we did here, and, the, and we're looking at the, that uh, DNMT activity assay that we showed before, that colometric 96-well plate. Here we are in the preoptic area. Here's the female is higher than the male, consistent with what we've seen before. Here's a female that two days earlier we degranulated her mast cells, or we injected her with PGE2. Her DNMT activity is severely repressed in the case of the mast cell degranulation um, and down to the male level in the terms of the PGE2. Show that there. Okay, but what about other brain regions? I've, I said I've done a deep dive into the POA. Everybody always wants to know, does this generalize to other brain regions? The short answer is no, it does not generalize, but do, is it relevant to other brain regions? In the course of our analysis of the mast cells, because there's so few, it's relatively easy to look throughout the brain, not necessarily quantified. I'll just point out to you here, these little green dots are the mast cells. The POA is just stuffed full of them in, in the neural pill. Hippocampus, they tend to hang out just below, near the habenula, uh, in the meninges, but they're really, really packed in by the hippocampus. So, and they're also, oh, by the way, around the uh, amygdala quite a bit, and we do not see them up here around cortex at all. They seem to have, a, it, it, this is in, in the neonate. So we did the same, uh, the hippocampus, we did the same activity in the same animals, beautiful sex difference. The females have significantly higher DNMT activity, and it is reduced by 48080 and marginally by PGE2. This is still pilot data, uh, but it certainly speaks to the potential that mast cells are regulating DNM DNMT activity in the hippocampus as well as the POA. So that then, the circular argument is where does the inflammation come from in the males? Are we trying to say that the steroid is causing the inflammation in the males? I don't know. Uh, we usually think of steroids as relatively anti-inflammatory, and it just, it, it doesn't fit. So where is the inflammation coming from? Oops. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Blame it on mom, right? And that's why I say no surprise, right? Because we always blame it on mom. I got those out of order. So, so blame it on mom. So it's known that during pregnancy, the maternal immune system has to be suppressed, right? Because otherwise, you're going to reject this foreign fetus. It is anecdotally and sort of universally agreed that that suppression is less effective against male fetuses than female fetuses. So we are hypothesizing and intending to test the notion that the maternal immune system is attacking the male fetus more than the female fetus, and potentially maternal immune cells are crossing the placenta and gaining access to the maternal, uh, the fetal uh, unit. It is known in humans that human T cells have crossed the placenta into human fetuses. I'm postulating that mast cells or perhaps T cells are crossing the placenta into the fetus and getting all the way into his brain and into his preoptic area. I forgot to mention we can't find any evidence that those mast cells are proliferating in the male brain to make more. And there they set up a low level of inflammation. That inflammation then is going to inhibit the DNMT enzymes. That is going to block the methylation of the immune response genes. And then now we have a nice runaway inflammatory response in the male that may be maintained across the lifetime. And it shouldn't really be considered an inflammatory response. It's just part of maleness. Evolution works with the tools it's given. If there's inflammation mediating molecules in the brain, they've been co-opted for the purpose of masculinization. 
So what does this mean in terms of possible relevance to human health and disease? So being male is your leading biological predictor of your relative risk for a developmental neuropsychiatric disorder, as well as your risk of dying in utero, your risk of having an injury at birth, the outcome of that injury in birth. And basically, almost everything that happens early in life is harder on males, unless it's got a, a XY chromosome effect. So autism, we know four and a half to five times more frequent in boys. Early onset schizophrenia, three to one more frequent in boys than girls. Dyslexia, three to one boys to girls, as well as any other speech or language disorder, attention um, deficit hyperactivity disorder. Estimates vary as 10 to one is on the high side, but that's, some studies uh, say that. And there's a cultural contribution as well, of course. Um, stuttering, four to one boys to girls. Tourette's, three to one boys to girls. And early life inflammation is the leading environmental predictor of your relative risk of a developmental neuropsychiatric disorder, particularly for autism, schizophrenia, and ADHD, uh, where the evidence has accumulated much more strongly than for the others at this point. So can that be relevant to humans? So this is a paper, a review paper published by Donna Whirling in Biology of Sex Differences, in which she looks at um, autism spectrum disorder risk genes and genes that are regulated in the developing brain of males and females fetuses. She did this all in humans. She just went back and reanalyzed other people's data. Uh, she did both fetal and adult male autistics and adult normative males. And she, you can see the only place that there's overlap in the two is in the microglia or astrocyte associated genes. She found that there was no higher expression of autism risk genes in autistic individuals. What was higher was genes normally associated with male brain development. So this is a direct quote from the data paper, which is in Nature Communications. This is uh, with Whirling and uh, Geshwind. Microglia and astrocyte markers and genes upregulated in ASD brain tend toward higher expression in prenatal male brain. So the conclusion being that this normal process of masculinization puts the males at risk by somehow putting them at a closer to a vulnerability threshold. Um, and of course, obviously, every fetus that's exposed to the flu in utero is not going to wind up with autism or schizophrenia, et cetera. There's many other factors. Uh, but there's got to be some biological basis for the much higher rate in males. And I would suggest that uh, part of it is, is this uh, confluence of events that increase the inflammation in the male. So I'll end with th thanking the uh, funding agencies who have supported this and other work in my laboratory, and of course, all the excellent students and postdocs who actually do all the work in my laboratory. Alrighty, thank you.